welcome to the Stokecast, where each week we bring you an inspiring athlete, adventurer, or entrepreneur and dig into their stories and strategies for balancing work, life, and adventure while having fun and making a difference. I'm Jonathan Ronzio. And I'm Emily Holland. Thanks for joining us today. Let's get to it. Welcome to the Stokecast, episode two, actually our first official episode post you uh, learning a little bit about who me and Emily are. Um, Today on the show, we've got Brody Levin, and uh, we'll tell you a little bit about Brody in a second. Once we uh, jump into his his interview, I'll kind of list off his his resume of feats, but but I will say one one thing that, that really... Uh, you know, prior to even chatting with Brody, I had known who he was for, for years and, and felt like uh, the trajectory of our lives were, were somehow paralleled uh, in a way in, in the sense that um, just the way he approaches a multitude of adventure sports and mm-hmm. Brody kind of like is a self-professed adventurer, you know, no, not a professional this or professional that. I mean, probably most mostly a skier, but he even yeah. says like skiing is what he likes the least of what he does. (laughs) So true. Yeah. I think with him, I, um, I've known about him for a while too. Uh, and I, I think the thing that resonated with me is that he's very like self-aware and understanding that like being pro doesn't mean you have to be the best, but maybe the best version of, of yourself, but also like, um, bringing something new to the table or like taking risks or doing something a little bit beyond, uh, what is the the clear path towards something? You know right. what I mean? Yeah, what did like you say to, earlier? You, you don't have to be pro to be professional, right? Yes, I did say that. Spot I'm on, Emily. so smart. So yeah, that's that's what I love about Brody's story in, in the sense that he, he just owns the fact. He even says he's like, he's a professional adventure skier, but not the best skier. Yeah. And just is out there having the most fun, trying to, trying to just plan these expeditions and go for it and... And you'll hear a little about how he he got to where he is, and uh, you know how he initially uh, approached brands and tried to get sponsors behind the crazy things that he was doing, um, <laughs> and really how he went from a Midwest DJ to a professional adventurer. <laughs> yeah, he has a really interesting background of like growing up, yeah, in the Midwest and around no mountains to like yeah, going to some of the biggest mountains in the world and skiing like the craziest lines, and also like having a business around his name. That's right. So, uh, super well-rounded guy, uh, really fun to talk to, and I'm sure you're going to learn a lot from Brody's story. Hope you enjoy. So today on the show, we have Brody Levin. Brody is a professional adventure skier, storyteller, avalanche awareness educator, and environmental steward. You can find Brody climbing and skiing some of the world's wildest mountains, bikepacking around Iceland, Norway, or Pacific Northwest volcanoes, Uh, dangling off rock walls, or even rocking the suit and taking his adventure stories to the steps of Capitol Hill to advocate for climate change policy. Do we miss anything? Or is is that it? Uh, No, that was was awesome. Thanks for that. (laughs) All right, great. Well, thanks for taking the time to chat with us today. We're excited to uh, dig into your stories. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thanks, guys. Yeah, so Brody, we want to definitely talk about your mountain adventures and the rad stuff you're doing outside and obviously your activism work that you're doing in D.C., but the first thing we want to get into is where this journey began for you. So where are your roots? Where did this all begin? I like grew up in like a very adventurous place, like huge mountains, um, just surrounded by people climbing mountains. Um, it's this little town in northeastern Ohio uh, outside of Cleveland. <laughs> Ohio on everybody's bucket list. Yeah, totally. It's it's hard to miss if you love mountains, but I uh yeah, I was fortunate enough to grow up there and you no, know, super flat. I grew up like five minutes from a ski hill, but the ski hill is two hundred and ten vertical feet. Oh, um, is that is that Brandywine? Uh it's it's Brandywine's like little sister. <laughs> um I would get to go to Brandywine like twice a year for big ski vacations because that was like forty five minutes away. Um gotcha. and I didn't grow up in a family of skiers, so you know, if my parents wanted to take me somewhere like Brandywine or if I got super lucky, like Pennsylvania, uh, they would have to just sit in the lodge while I skied like bell to bell. And so (laughs) it was, it wasn't, you know, the most practical thing to do every day, but I could, you know, they could drop me off at Alpine, go home. And then I would, it's called Alpine Valley. Um, and I would do this thing where I'd, (laughs) cause you know, like 12 year old me skiing around and I would ski, like I would be the last person on the hill. Like 
I remember multiple times the lifties would come out of their shacks because it takes like literally between like four and 11 seconds to get down the runs <laughs> and the, the lifties would come out of their shack. It would be like pouring rain. It's like 1030 at night because I didn't know there was day skiing until I moved out of Ohio. I had only skied at night, like after school. Oh, wow. Um, and so the lifties would like come out of their shack. It's like raining at nighttime. And I'm, I'm literally the only person at the hill and they would be like, Brody. And I'm like, what? They're like, go home so I can <laughs> close this place up and go home. Cause yeah. And so I'd like go into the lodge and pick up the payphone and press zero and call the operator and say, I'd like to make a collect call. And the operator would say, cool, who? And I'm like, give him my parents' phone number and I'd call home and you know, they'd say, please state your name at the beep. And I'd go, it's Brody, come pick me up. <laughs> and so my Genius. parents would get this collect call from, it's Brody, come pick me up. And they, <laughs> and they would, I wouldn't have to pay the, you know, 20 cents for the phone call that way. And they would just come and I would just keep taking laps for, you know, six minutes until they got to the bottom. And you could just see the parking lot at the bottom. So I would see when the one car pulled in and then I'd like ski up to the car and I'd be like, guys, I, I learned this new trick. And they'd like, you know, watch me take one more lap and. Uh, I'd go up and I'd come back down and, and so, yeah, I did that a lot, like every single day. I mean, I started only skiing one day a week and then by the time I was like 14, I got a season's pass and I was skiing every day. It was awesome. Yeah. So you were out there by yourself? Yeah, pretty much on my own. I had like one ski buddy cause you know, they didn't have like a, I was a park skier, right? Like I liked hitting jumps and rails and skiing backwards, except we didn't have a park. Um, <laughs> and so like I would, I, I would like build these own jumps with my hands and then you, that was like against the rules. And so I would like build the jumps with the, my hands until like the, the bad guys who were like, I don't know they were ski patrol or somebody on <laughs> that would just guys. ride around on a snowmobile. They would like come find you and they would like ride over your jump with their snowmobile. And you'd be like, Oh man, I just spent like 15 minutes making that. And you know, they'd like be like, Oh, you got to stop doing this Brody. And I'm like, okay. And I like, go do it somewhere else. And I'm not one to break rules, but that's like the one big rule I've broken in my life is constantly building jumps. So it sounds like you were kind of always, uh, internally motivated by your own, uh, personal passions. Like at an age when everybody else is out there trying to do things socially to fit in, you had your own thing and, and you were just out there doing it. Yeah. My parents would always say like, I, would, <clears throat> I was like beating my own drum because it was just like. You know, I was a soccer player. That was like the real thing that I did. I like played soccer every day and blah, blah, blah. And like that was my sport. But I just had this and like that was like a very normal, you know, kid thing to do. And in the way in which I did it, you know, I played in the traveling team and the whatever the select team and for the high school and everything. But I just had this other thing that I always seemed to like more, which was skiing, which didn't fit. I mean, I would sit there and throw like temper tantrums and just cry with my parents when I was a little oh. kid and be like, why did you raise me here? Like, this has ruined my life. You know, like, why can't I be one of these guys I'm reading about in the magazines that grew up in Aspen or New Hampshire, you know, somewhere crazy mountainous. <laughs> um, and it, it was just, it was so like defeating because I'm like, I'm never going to make it because something about me, I'm like, I want to be a professional skier. And I'm like, a 12 year old in Ohio who sucks at skiing. <laughs> I wasn't even the best at my little hill. Like straight up, there were just like kids better than me. And I was like, but what is it about this that, that I like so much? And I just kept going. Yeah, so what is it about skiing or about being in the mountains that keeps you pushing and keeps you going, keeps you motivated? Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm sure you guys can relate to this. Like it's, it's evolved, you know, like what I originally liked about it, which was literally the act of skiing. Um, which you ask, you know, so many people what they love about skiing. It's like, oh, like the sound of this snow beneath my feet and like the wind <laughs> through my hair. Like that's, that's not it anymore for me. Um, I'm sure that's what I liked at the beginning and the adrenaline rush. I still love the adrenaline rush of like, it's, it's changed from park skiing to ski mountaineering, but right. I still love that rush of, you know, trying to do things safely and stay alive, but still to push my body and my mind. But, um, it's also changed. Like it's, it's, it's morphed into, you know, skiing is my vehicle to see the world now. And it's my vehicle to meet people and, and try to do good. And, uh, and it's also my career. So it's, you know, it's, it's changed a lot over time. Totally, man. I, I feel like I relate in a very similar way. I mean, I can think back to, uh, building snowboard jumps behind my middle school and like 
when I threw my first 360. Oh, heck yeah, man. Yeah, and how, like, at the time, that was everything. And uh, for snowboarding, that was it. But now that snowboarding is more a means to experience the mountains. Totally. And that I didn't know would be the case when I was in Ohio. You know, I didn't know I craved the experience in the mountains. I just liked the act of riding. But once I was able to get out, which I went to, like, a... I saved all my pennies and went to like a ski academy for my last two years of high school. I went to, I moved to Vermont and went to the ski academy where I could ski, uh, six days a week for half the day. Nice. Um, awesome. We would like get tutored the other half of the day. Um, and it was, you know, it was super expensive and it was really hard for me to go to cause I was paying for it myself, my little, you know, my teenage self. And it was, uh, but I was like, you know, if I want to see if I have a chance in skiing or if I just want to ever get out of Ohio, like, this might be my way to do it. So I like went to Vermont for, for two winters in a row and and really fell in love with it and realized that a, I was definitely not the best and B like, it is something I I truly enjoyed doing. Yeah. So it sounds like going from Ohio to then Vermont and eventually the mountains out West, you had to be willing to take some uh, uncomfortable steps to kind of break past the norms what an Ohio kid should or and that's kind of like pervasive in my life oh sorry no 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 problem you, yeah let's get into it um it, it's like pervasive like I, I I shouldn't be making it I I shouldn't be the one loving it coming from Ohio and the same <laughs> thing now like I shouldn't be a professional skier in some regards you know like I'm not the best skier out there and people think professional athlete you think someone who is the best and I am not the best but i figure out how to way how to make a career doing what i love to do and not being the best because it's not all about just being the best especially these days you know right. um as far as being an asset to the brands and that i work with and those kind of things and and in relating to to my fellow skiers like not you know never, most people aren't the best at their ski hill and uh and so i've been able to kind of latch on to that concept of the best is not always the most important and in my case that's really lucky because i just I can't be, you know, like I'm, I'm just not the best. I'm a kid from Ohio who's skiing every day. We're, we're both just nodding our heads over here. Like that's, yes, absolutely. I, mean, I think so many people can relate to the fact that like you, you can succeed without having to become the best. And there's like the aspirational people you look up to because they are the best, you know, like I'll go on photo shoots with some of my friends who are the best skiers in the world. And that is an amazing experience for me. And I look up to them the same anyone looks up to them. Um, and, and that's really, really cool for me. And I'm like, those people deserve to be professional skiers. So what is it about me that makes me deserve it? So we got the backstory of growing up in Ohio. We talked a little bit about going to Vermont to test out skiing out there. And then you end up going to college out west. So tell us a little bit about that decision and the journey out there. I wasn't even going to go to college. I like, I, you know, most, well, first of all, like most of the, I'd say a vast majority actually of professional skiers end up not going to college because it interferes with their, with their ski careers. And, and for me, it was for a different reason. I had started this business in Ohio when I was nine years old. Um, oh, the I'd DJ started business. this DJ business. Exactly. You did your homework. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you heard of DJ extreme like in 1999, <laughs> really? And so, um, and so, yeah, I started this, this business and it was, it was doing great, you know, not when I was nine, not when I was 11, but when I was 14, I hired an employee. Wow. And when I was, or yeah, when I was 14, it was full time. When I was 15, I hired an employee. Like it was, it was doing really well. And I was very, um, entrepreneurial and I was really driven and I was really driven by money and by showing people a good time. And it was like super Ohio of me. You know, like that was like the most Ohio thing you can do if you're a driven person. I'm like, man, how can I be different and like do what I want to do and like and, and you know succeed? And like starting a business was very practical to do. Um, and all right, hold hold on. Yeah, <laughs> Let, let's let's backtrack on. You started a business at nine years old. Like let's let's talk about how, when, why. Yeah. Uh, and, th- and that like early entrepreneurial version of yourself, like let's talk about how, how some of those characteristics have translated into what you do today, the business of Brody, how you market yourself. Sure. Yeah. Great question, man. Um, I, I, it, it came from like the entrepreneurial part is just like me. I like, you know, I didn't need to have a job when I was nine years old and really like the business didn't start at nine. I, I took a $300 loan from my parents when I was nine <laughs> Nice. and I, 
paid that back eventually by DJ. I think I had my first DJ job when I was nine years old. I DJed like, you know, a friend's Halloween party and got a $50 gift certificate to the CD store for it. Ooh, the CD and, store. Um, <laughs> nice. Yeah. And like it was, I'm sure it wasn't a $50, probably a $15 gift certificate, like enough <laughs> for, you know, one CD. And, um, and that was like the start of it for me. And I, I don't know why I was so driven to, to do something different um to you know my family didn't have a lot of money and i but i certainly didn't need to go out be you know financially on my own when i was 14 or whatever like i ended up doing um in many regards but i yeah there was just something about it and i think it kind of rooted i had like this really intense love of hip-hop when nice. i was like young like you know eight nine i just like loved like break dancing and the beastie boys and the radio stations that played Ja Rule and like you know I, I was just like I loved rap music and I loved hip hop and I loved kind of that whole culture as much as you could be informed of it you know without the internet and with MTV and that's about it um, and I was just super into it and I saw all those DJs like scratching like on MTV spring break and, and like they were like scratching vinyl records you know like that sound and I loved that and I'm like I want to get a turntable and some vinyl I'll use my dad's old vinyl and like I want to make that scratching sound. And I took that $300 loan and I bought a turntable and a mixer. Awesome. And, and a, and a needle. And I got one of my dad's old records and I put it on there and I didn't know how to make that sound. So I took the needle. This is in my parents' basement when I was nine years old. I took the needle and I just dragged it across like my dad's old Beatles record. Oh, that's what I was going to ask if your dad knew what record you were scratching. (laughs) And like, and he didn't know how to do it either, you know, like uh, I, I also got like my first skateboard when I was eight years old or whatever. And like he didn't I'm like, which foot do I put in front? And he's like, I know there's like this thing skateboarding, but I don't know which foot you put in front. You know, oh. it's like without the Internet, without like movies and, and just by virtue of being in Ohio and not being surrounded by like, I don't know, culture of, <laughs> of any like diverse variety, you know, or, you know, or like of any information like that. And so I'm just dragging this needle back and forth. I'm like, that's kind of the right sound, but I don't think that's quite it, you know, and. So I eventually uh, got a mail order catalog and I mail ordered a VHS tape that was like instructional of like how to, you know, like turntablism 101. And oh, I was never going to make any money doing that sort of very musically inclined DJing. Um, <laughs> but I started being like a mobile DJ and I was like, you know, playing kids birthday parties once every six months. And then I was, you know, picking up a whatever here and there, like a school dance and then like a prom and like a wedding and. Yeah, by the time I was, you know, 14 years old, it was like every single weekend. I had business cards. I had a website. I had, you know, ads in the phone book um, and in the newspaper. And and it was all word of mouth. And I remember these business cards like said, you know, it was DJ Extreme because that was like the coolest word at the time. And it was Brody's <laughs> Extreme Sound. It, it was from Brody's DJ service to Brody's Extreme Sounds. And <laughs> That's um, nice re- and rebranding. Got, yeah, that was a great rebrand for like, you know, yeah, year 2000 or whatever. <laughs> Um, cause it couldn't be any cooler than that. And I remember my business cards that I like printed out at home to start with. It said, I'm just a young teenage DJ who plays your music and mine because <laughs> I, I had this problem where I couldn't, I didn't have all the music I needed. Like CDs were expensive and like I couldn't have, and I kept getting requests for songs that I didn't have. So like, that was my polite way of saying like, can I borrow your cds you being the client when i like dj a job like you know whatever music you like here i'll just take your cds and play those you know uh, (laughs) resourcefulness and yeah so that kind of took off and so anyway so fast forward i almost didn't go to college because that was doing so well and when i went to ski academy it really had to take the back burner for a second i would fly home if i got like you know a big enough prom to dj i would fly home for the weekend from vermont to dj a show but it was no longer every weekend and i was able to um see that there was more to life than just DJing these jobs and just making money. And that's like, you know, junior year, I decided, eh, maybe, maybe I should go to college, if anything else, to learn how to be a better business person. So I ended up, you know, I'm like, oh, I want to, and I, you know, I fell in love with skiing during those last two years of high school, wanted to move to New England, or excuse me, wanted to move out West, like take the next step that follows New England logically. And I, uh, I knew that would, for me, for me as a park skier, that would be Utah, because, you know, the biggest and best parks were here. Um, and I'm like, all right, I'm going to have to liquidate my business completely to do this. But at that point, like things meant more to me than just money. So you always had that like internal, you know, the personal drive to push yourself to progress in, in these aspects of your life that you might 
not really know uh, about, know how to do. Like you saved up to order that VHS to teach yourself how to be a DJ so that you could go and make money being a DJ. Like you, you had that ability to hold yourself accountable to your own future and your own success. Like, uh, let's talk about that. I think I knew pretty early on I didn't want to work for anyone. Like that was clear when my friends were starting to get jobs at, you know, 16 at Dairy Queen. And I'm like, <laughs> actually, I'm, I'm doing all right playing school dances in Ohio you and go. you know I'm one of the I'm traveling all over doing this and like you know I'm getting a name for myself doing this and, and I I like that little bit of recognition which is you know without with before social media and I like that little bit of um I, I don't know what the word is like I liked being on stage with my you know CD players <laughs> like playing music and people were having a good time because of what I was doing up there or at least facilitated by what I was doing up there um and, you know, like getting on the microphone and making sure everyone is having fun and dancing and whatever. And 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 I liked that. And I liked the business aspect. I, I liked rushing home from, you know, high school senior year to work on contracts and negotiating for equipment. And I had this big trailer full of gear. And, you know, I was able to drive. I drove a trailer my first week with my driver's license. I was driving a 15 foot long trailer, too, you know, because it was like that was part of the gig. And I like and I just, I, I liked being my own boss. I, I guess that's kind of it. And not really having someone else tell me what to do. As, as I, like I said, my friends were starting to work at Dairy Queen and I just wanted a different work experience. Um, and that translated when I did go to college, I, I lost that, you know, I was no longer that person. Um, and I started rock climbing a little bit and working at the climbing gym. But then I, the next iteration of that kind of was, um, the, my sophomore year I ran for student body president. Um, which up until then, all the student body presidents at this little liberal arts private school in Salt Lake, like they had mostly been kids from Utah um, right. who knew Utah well. And thus, I thought could like, you know, serve the student body in an easier way. You know, when someone asks the president, like, hey, where's the best restaurant? Or like, what are we doing this weekend? Like, they're not looking at a map to try to figure out where they are in Salt Lake <laughs> City, you know, but I decided to run for it. And, and I won. And so I was running this organization of 80 volunteers Um when I was a sophomore, um, wow. you know, which is still the kind of time I'm looking up at the older kids. I'm like, Oh man, you guys are like the big guys on campus, you know, but I decided to start running this stuff. And then I ran again and I won again. So I ended up doing it through my senior year. Um, and that was just kind of the next iteration and skiing. I was still skiing most days, but it also kind of took a back burner as this opportunity to, it felt like an, being an entrepreneur again, because, you know, I was rebranding our student government and I was making it cool and appealing and, at the same time, I was, you know, talking to student body presidents from other colleges and like kind of networking with them as far as I guess you'd call it like best practices now and and talking about, you know, the most effective ways and the best concerts they're hosting and, you know, what they're doing for civic engagement and uh, getting students involved in the community and volunteering and all of those things. So it was starting to tie into much more than just self-serving. You know, DJing was very much about the money and the pride and those kind of things. And this started to be about much more than that. Um but at the same time, it was it was still able to tickle the ego a little bit, you know, um, and and then I graduated and I quickly needed a job. And that's when it kind of became, OK, I can I can still satisfy all those urges, being my own boss, being an entrepreneur, um, building a business, building a brand, tickle the ego, do it all through hopefully being a professional skier. Yeah, and now you obviously are a professional skier, but you're so much more than that, right? You're a speaker, you're an activist, and, and when I think of a well-rounded mountain athlete, a mountain person in the outdoor community, I think of you. So when you got started doing all of this, you created, you basically created a career for yourself where there wasn't one before. There wasn't a blueprint. It was a totally new thing. So which of your background or which of your experiences or education helped you build this blueprint, build this roadmap so you could succeed? Yeah, I think, I mean, I did get, I got a degree in economics and like the philosophy of economics, so to speak. And um, I, uh, this, this college I went to, Westminster, we like, it really taught you like how to think. I didn't take all these math classes and I didn't come out with this piece of paper that then you go to your employer and ask for a job or whatever prospective employer you know it was for me it was very much about how to think and it was about a general business education um college was really an, an end in itself it wasn't a means to another end for me i just like wanted to learn and i wanted to become a better person i wanted to be able to offer something to the community and the college community and the greater community and and i was able to do that through there um and then when i graduated i went through high school and college without any social media and i'm 
I'm, I'm 30, you know, like I graduated college in 2010, like Facebook and everything was very, very prevalent at the time. It was, I was the minority. I was like the only person who didn't have it, you know? <laughs> and I just didn't like it. I had saw no reason for it, blah, blah, blah. And then I graduated and my first student loan came due six months later. No oh boy. And I was like, Oh God, I have to pay for this. And, and I saw this opportunity to, to take advantage of this this social media, which was just growing so quickly. And so I went to these brands. I remember I went to one trade show and I'm like, I took all my savings. I went on like a couple big trips to try to help make a name for myself. And then I had no money left. And I went to one of the outdoor retailer trade shows and the snow sports industry of America trade shows. And I went there and I was like, okay, this is, this is it. I can either walk out of here pretty much a professional athlete, or I can walk out of here and, you know, go get a job at Dairy Queen. (laughs) And, And I like had this whole portfolio, this presentation. And the idea wasn't like, hey, I'm Brody Levin. You guys should pay me to be me. It was like, hey, I'm pretty much this no name who's trying to do cool stuff, going on good trips. Why don't you pay me for exactly the value that I offer you? Not based on reputation, but based on the quantifiable information. And this is, I don't know what year this is, 2011 or 12 or something like that and 13. And I was like, you know, why don't you pay me, for example, I'm going to make a little video from this ski thing that I did or this bike thing that I did. You guys can decide how much it's worth to you and pay me per thousand views. Or I just started this social media account. Why don't you pay me for every, you know, pay me $8 for every hundred followers I gain. Um, and like that way they could choose the, how, how they wanted to quantify the, the content that I was producing, which was like not a thing at the time at all. I was like, I came to all these team managers with this idea and they like, they were like, whoa, this is like, we're used to paying a, a, a retainer fee and a photo incentive. And I'm like, well, I'm not really getting shots published in magazines and a retainer is based off someone's reputation. So like, you're not going to pay me for those reasons, but like, think about it. Like you're going to have to go to your boss and get approval, but think about it because I have value I can offer, but you only need to pay me if I offer that to you. And some brands actually bit. They were like, okay, this is like very innovative and very forward thinking. It's going to be hard to get approval because we don't know how much money to budget for you because we don't know how successful you're going to be. And there were like very practical problems like that. But I, I went to, I went for it as in as a pragmatic approach as possible. And, and it started working a little bit and I walked out of there making money as a skier and not doing anything else. Um, but, but it was doing something else cause it was this creating content, which was not a thing at the time. And, and so quickly I was like the most followed skier on social media, which is ridiculous because I wasn't the most famous skier at all. <laughs> like I, you know, I started getting these interviews about me, but they were just like Brody Levin, the Instagram skier or oh, whatever, man. because I like latched onto it right away. And, you know, the real famous skiers in the world weren't latching onto it. And now fast forward a few years and the tables have turned like they are the most famous skiers in the world. And thus they are also the most followed skiers in the world now, you know, like the, the whole ski industry, like I was out ahead of them and they all came and caught up to me. Cause like it, you know, kind of put things back in where you're supposed to be as far as like your fame and your notoriety. Um, but I was, I was really the first person to latch onto that idea is like, let me provide something for you besides just a reputation and you can put a, you know, whatever price tag on that you want. So that's a super smart strategy. Uh, congrats on that and getting some brands to bite. And and now you are a pro skier, but you you are also doing uh, some other really interesting stuff. Like you just got back from D.C.? Yeah, I got back yesterday from D.C. And that was my second time there this month. And you were there with uh, American Alpine Club and an access fund, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. When did you decide to kind of loop this activism piece into what you're doing in the mountains and and get really involved with some of these organizations and and be going to D.C.? I like I almost feel like a hypocrite because I like, you know, so many people in student government get involved because they want to become actual government. You know, like they (laughs) like student politics because they're practicing for when they run for senator or whatever. And I always was able to like appeal to students because I was like, guys, I'm just trying to make us have the best time in college possible. I don't want to be a politician, you know, (laughs) and here I am now going to D.C. every few months or a couple times a year. 
And I'm like, no, no, I swear I don't want to be a politician. I just happen to be a little involved in politics now. Like I wasn't I wasn't I was I meant it when I said that, you know, um, and so all these other, you know, student body presidents that I was working with at the time, they're all have gone on to, you know, work in the governor's office or, you know, running for city council or whatever. And I'm I have no I have no political aspirations besides to I have like I have more I have citizen aspirations, not political aspirations. I I don't want to work in D.C. I want to go there and be a voice for the outdoor community and I don't want to run for office. I want to hold the people who do choose to run for office accountable and and so that was that kind of came pretty quickly just because i was all right i was a, you know a professional skier for a couple of years and i was like traveling the world and and after a couple of years of it i was like man this is even if i'm coming back to share these stories and hopefully inspire people to whatever it is get outside or challenge themselves or do something good it it wasn't fulfilling enough to me just traveling around skiing because that's ostensibly what I was doing traveling around on someone else's bill and skiing all over the world and coming back and sharing those stories. And that's like a cop out. That's what like a lot of pro athletes do. You know, they're like, Oh, we're going to inspire people. And that's just frequently just a way of saying, I'm going to go do something and hope maybe someone else will care about it. And, and so I'm like, man, what else can I do? And, you know, and throughout college and actually throughout my life, I was just very environmentally aware. And I was as student body president. I was working on a lot of environmental initiatives. And I'm like, OK, now I'm, I'm a skier. How can I kind of continue that without having the, the, quote, power of student body president? How can I do that with the, quote, power of professional skier? And and it was it was pretty obvious kind of to me, you know, like through some public speaking, through the organizations I can volunteer with and through uh, my the platform that I've created um, as a skier, uh, I can start discussing and hopefully making the needle move on the issues that I care about. Um, so in 2013, I climbed and skied Denali uh, with Jeremy Jones and he found out about like my history and environmental activism, um, especially throughout college. And he's like, well, like, you know, uh, three years ago or five years ago, I started this organization called protect our winters. You should think about joining it. And I didn't have, you know, they like having these famous skiers and snowboarders get involved and I didn't have that fame, but I did have that passion. And thus I got involved with them. And over the past five years, I've become extremely involved with them. Um, and I, you know, I try to be their most active volunteer and do as much as possible with them. And, and that's kind of, uh, eventually translated into other groups like the Sierra club, American Alpine club, winter Wildlands Alliance, uh, Heal Utah, Access Fund, other groups like that that I volunteer with. So all of that is amazing, um, but but you just hit a buzzword for me, and I I need to uh, call it back to Denali. Yeah. So last June, um, three three of my best friends and I actually went up and uh, and we split boarded Denali. Oh, right on, man! Congratulations. Thank That's you. Sweet. So uh, when when we were preparing for that trip, I actually found one of your blog posts on Tahoe Mountain Sports that was all about like the essential gear for packing for Denali, and there wasn't a whole lot uh, beyond that, and I found it super helpful. So thank you. Oh, right on, man. That's you know like wait, wait, it was on Tahoe Mountain Sports. You said yeah, yeah, that was the one. Okay, because I I did this so. Oh, that is wait. What what route did you guys snowboard? Uh, we we did the uh, the West Buttress. Right on, dude! Congratulations, that is so cool, man. Um, I I rode my it was right after college before those student loans came due. I like, I I rode my bike across the country because I was like so bored and had nothing to do. <laughs> and my mom, I was like living in Montana, and my parents were like, "Hey, you gonna come home for Thanksgiving?" And I'm like, "Yeah, sure. I'm gonna like leave tomorrow." And I like got a road bike, which I had never ridden a road bike before, and I just like started pedaling across country. Um, naturally and every day I was like by myself and I didn't have an iPhone and I was just like bored and I would pedal and it sucked cause I wasn't a biker and, and whatever. And, <laughs> um, and it was snowing and raining like every single day on me and I'm just like pedaling into the headwinds across freaking North Dakota and, <laughs> and my, and I get this like, um, or I get home earlier than I thought and I was going home for Thanksgiving, but I got home on like in early October and I was like, well, kids, like twiddling my thumbs. And I had uh, mailed my laptop home before I left. So I would have it there when I got there. And so I just went on like, you know, whatever.com and started a blog like Brody11.com. And I just went back and rewrote verbatim every day's blog entry. So it's like day one. I was writing it, you know, a month after day one. But I was like, day one, you know, today sucks. I don't know how to ride a bike, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and and so I like wrote about that. And after a couple of days of it, I um, I sent it 
to like everyone I know, you know, I like pulled up my old student body president email list and sent it to all the administrators at my college, which is probably some conflict of interest or something. And I like, <laughs> I pulled up, you know, I just, I just went through all my contacts again before social media or anything. And I just sent it to everyone. And I started to get like a little following, you know, I got like, Oh, 300 people read my blog today. And so after I was done going through rewriting my journal from Viking across the country, I'm like, Oh gosh, I need to like start writing about other stuff. So I started writing about other trips. And then as I went on trips, I would write about those trips and I, you know, started writing every single day and tapered off to once a week or a couple times a week. But I had this like big following and that was, I, I guess, in essence, my first kind of social media because people really started to follow that. And, and when I eventually kind of like just ended it because it was taking too much of my time, it was like, all right, like I have a, a following now. So how can I transfer that to something good? And that's when I kind of started to use it as social media. But that blog is where I did things was like w- such as you know, write about gear for Denali or like write about what it's like to go to South America for two months and not speak a word of Spanish or, or whatever it is. You know, those were the kind of stories I was writing on there. And, um, yeah, it was cool to know people read that stuff. So thanks. (laughs) Absolutely, man. Thank you. Uh, it, it definitely helped us prepare for the trip. Right on. All right. So this, this is related to Denali, but, um, I want to say I was actually looking at your website and on your about page, the like one of the very first lines on there, if not the first line, it says like I am Brody Levin. I have never eaten meat. Yeah, and I know you you grew up vegetarian, so it's not like a uh, a big statement about you know a, a diet or a way of life. But um, but so for for Denali, it was during a, a period of my life that I was like trying to be vegan or nice. uh, trying to do vegetarian mostly. Nice. And um, and we actually did myself and my friend Ryan. We did the mountain meatless. And, and I'm just curious your take on uh, being an adventure athlete uh, who doesn't eat meat and, and like how you fuel yourself about with it. Yeah, w- well, you guys are in Boston, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we are. I don't know if you see this when you, I, I, when you come out west, but like there's this I, – I've like used to be asked that question and it's, it's pretty much stopped. Like people – it seems at least out west that people have like latched onto the idea and they get it now. They're like, okay, you don't need meat as made clear by this, 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 and this, you know, like it is possible to do this without meat. And for me, I've never eaten meat. So I obviously don't need it. Like, I don't know if my body's just adapted to it or what, but you know, if people are like, Oh, I feel like this, this dearth of this lack of whatever, if I don't eat it, I'm like, well, I don't know what that feels like because maybe I feel it every day of my entire life, Yeah. but I have no idea because I've never had it. Right. Um, and so, yeah, maybe I don't have enough of X, Y, Z, but I, I've never been one to like count calories or grams of protein or anything like that. I just, I just eat, I just eat healthy. I'm not concerned with, like I said, the amount of protein. I don't drink protein shakes. I don't, I don't look at any of that stuff. If something's, you know, if, if I'm going to make something, I'm just like, Oh, like what seems filling or what seems like healthy? You know, I'm just not eating junk food, not eating fast food. Um, and yeah, I mean, I just don't have a good answer. It's just like such a lifestyle for me. You know, the like, I'm going to Asia tomorrow and like it is it going to be difficult to be vegetarian yeah but is it like a is it like an option in my mind no you know I'll just (laughs) I'll just have to figure it out because I just don't eat meat it's like I'll look up the couple of dishes and I'll write them down on a piece of paper and I'll like go to a restaurant and I'll like hand them a piece of paper you know (laughs) and like that's that's just kind of the only way for that's the only that's the only thing I know and thus it's easy for me but I have a lot of respect for people like you who have chosen to do it um (laughs) after eating meat and knowing the way your body responds to it and also knowing i'm assuming how good meat must taste so good bacon (laughs) presumably yeah it's it's definitely a lot harder to give something up than to have never tried it i I would guess totally i was with um i was with uh another longtime vegetarian alex honnold this past week in dc and he was talking about he started to he's actually working with one of those companies that like makes fake meat products as like one of his sponsors wow. and he's like dude you should like get on that bandwagon and i like looked at the other athletes and it's like you know a bunch of nfl players and nba <laughs> players and alex honnold and i'm like yeah i'm like a ski mountaineer that no one's heard of like is that really what i need to you know like is that really possible but uh <laughs> but yeah and he's he's kind of saying the same thing because he came from eating meat so he's like a little more aware of the ways in which he is a vegetarian and for me it's just like pretty just blindly like i just look at the one thing on the menu that doesn't have meat in it. And it's not like, Oh man, 
everything else sounds so good. It's just like, yeah, that's what I'm going to have. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So speaking of lifestyle, um, we wanted to talk a little bit about how you balance everything because you're always traveling. You have a ton of stuff going on with your activism work and the groups that you work with, your brands mm. that you work with. Um, and we want to understand how you balance that all, how you make sure your relationships aren't suffering, that your you know mental uh, mindfulness is not suffering. How do you do that? Maybe I don't. I yeah, I, I, maybe maybe I don't. Like, I, I'm trying to think of the things I have to sacrifice in my life, which are a lot, right? I mean, for example, I sacrifice some ski ability <laughs> because I do more than just ski. I'm sure I could be a better skier if I went every day and if that's all I cared about. But I care about so much more than that. Why am I not going every day? Because maybe I'm, you know, getting my suit fitted to go to DC or maybe I decided to just go for a, a run that day. Right. And I could be a better ice climber, but you know, some days I would just go rather go rock climbing or I would rather go for a trail run in the snow. And so like in, in, and that is just a, a selfish thing. That is just to keep me interested, to keep me, I think fit in a more well-rounded way. It's kind of like the Jack of all trades, master of none. Like if I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of always training <laughs> and it's, it's not, I don't think of it as training. It's just like, Hey, what do I want to do today? Well, it's cloudy. So the skiing up high might be bad and it's running when it's cloudy, you know, that might be a nice temperature, but it might be kind of uninspiring. So maybe I just go climb in the gym today, but it's like, I'm, I'm not one of those people who have to move every day. Like by nature, I like to say my equilibrium is kind of on a couch <laughs> with like ice cream on my lap. Um, that's that's mine too. Know, like, yeah, see, like that's totally. I think that's a pretty normal thing. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, I I I don't need to move every day, but I force myself to. Just like a lot of people that you know, you see at twenty four hour fitness at six a.m. Um, <laughs> nobody necessarily wants to be doing that, or I think a lot of people don't. But um, I know it's important for me to to me to move my body every day. It's easy for me to sit and get stuck on emails all day, but. I'll, you know, try to get out for a bike ride or whatever. So I, I do sacrifice a lot. And the balance comes um, more emotionally for me because I know by having that balance of I did my emails for half the day, I'll get a couple hours of exercise and then I'll, you know, spend some time with my girlfriend. Like that is what I think my thought of balance is. But in reality is, is something else being compromised, like for sure, um, whether that's, you know, uh, I, I don't know, like something always is, you know, we're, we're always compromising. I don't think I'm alone in this at all. Like we always have to f try to strike that balance and something is probably going to fall by the wayside. Um, but I try to stay on top of it. And maybe the, the biggest thing for me is that I, 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 while equilibrium for me is on the couch, I don't do it. I like never sit on the couch and I'm like very proactive and I think self-motivated in so far as like, you know, if there's something at the bottom of the stairs that needs to go up, I will just take it instantly instead of being like, Oh, I'll take it next time. I need to go upstairs or my inbox is always at zero. Um, and you know, my car is always clean and the house is always organized. Cause if I get behind on one of those things, I feel like that's where stuff starts to snowball. And this is just by nature of this is who I am, right? Like I'm, I'm pretty OCD, but <laughs> yeah, I think it allows me to, then when I go in the mountains and my life is on the line or my partner's life is on the line, or I need to be belaying someone or whatever it is, I can be fully present without thinking about like, Oh man, I should have responded to those emails. Um, and I think by virtue of, of doing activities in the mountains that have, death as the highest consequence um i think it both demands and it's pretty natural to be totally present in those situations um and that's what that's what's nice because it allows me to escape a little bit and not just be thinking about you know day-to-day -day life and it's what makes me feel alive and I, I think that's really really important in today's world especially yeah dude i i relate in in so many of the same ways and i think uh, a lot of our listeners probably do as well and and that is a struggle for a lot of people who think they have to find some sort of singular focus on one thing to be successful and uh, sacrifice balance in other aspects. And, and Yeah, and I mean, if I were to try to succeed just as a skier, um, which I mean, I, I do, like I, I make my, my living from sponsors, but if, if I was to try to succeed just by saying I'm the best skier in the world, it wouldn't happen because I, I cannot have that singular focus, which is necessitated 
to be the best in the world. Um, I mean, that is that is an absolute requirement, I think, to have that, you know, whatever the 10,000 hour thing or whatever it is. Like, I just I don't have that drive in me to do it that way. I would much rather like I'm just like an adventure. I mean, like in reality, like I think one reason I call myself a professional skier is, is slightly out of like that ego thing. In reality, it's just like I'm a professional like ad- adventurer. I can like choose my sponsors will if i just stop skiing tomorrow and i chose to like oh i'm gonna go bike packing around the world or i'm gonna go try to climb this route that's never been climbed before they'll be like right there with me because i'm working with brands in a capacity that they understand that i'm appealing to people that do more than just one thing that care about more than just skiing they care about like being a well-rounded person and that's what i care about as well yeah so speaking of adventures we understand that you're going on a trip is it tomorrow that you're flying out that's correct. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So we've been following your preparations in your gear room. Looks really awesome. You're like throwing things around on the floor. <laughs> um, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you have coming up and where you're going to go do? Yeah. So I will, uh, the last couple of last year or so I've been planning this trip. Um, actually for the last couple of years, I was trying to go to this country of Georgia, which borders Russia um, kind of in like the Eurasia continent. And I, um, and I was trying to find the right line to ski there. And I knew there was really steep mountains and really big mountains and great ski mountaineering potential, but I just couldn't find what I wanted to do there. And when you're going like, you know, halfway around the world, you can't just be like, Oh, I'll just find something to ski when I'm there. (laughs) I mean, you can, I've done that before, but like, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for like big, steep technical lines that also have some story behind them and some kind of element of interest besides just people, who want to go steep skiing. Um, for sure. And so I, I, you know, was sitting on Google earth and researching the country and like found this, found this line that hasn't been totally skied. And it's on a, it's on a huge mountain. It's on the border of Russia. Like the summit of the mountain is the border of Russia or with Russia. Um, and, and yeah, I like did, you know, did the whole pitching for funding and did the whole blah, blah, blah. And like, and, and making it happen. And, um, I've been looking forward to this trip for a really long time. And now, you know, I'm loading up whatever it is, five duffel bags with gear and uh, flying half around the world for a month to try to climb and ski one line. (laughs) Well, that's absolutely epic. And uh, I'm super jealous over here. (laughs) Um, But that's so cool that that's like, you know, where you've built this up to. (laughs) I mean, I'll like, this is what I've, I guess, over the years, like it's it's kind of turned into this for me. You know, it's been like a series of small trips. You know, I haven't been home for a month. Um, and now I'm just going to, you know, I got home from DC yesterday and tomorrow I'm leaving for a month. And wow, I I do like this. It's like not getting old in so far as I'm enjoying the traveling still, but I'm trying to be more purposeful with it. Um, I'm trying to make sure I'm doing good storytelling either about the environment or about public lands or about avalanche education while I'm doing it. And I'm trying to, you know, I put a lot of time into the, the PR of it, so to speak, making sure it's getting in front of the right eyes of people that I think will actually take something positive away from it. Well, that's amazing. Um, we will absolutely be following along and, and cheering you on, hoping that all does go to plan. But uh, as as things do on these adventures, um, you know, you never know what happens. You know, you might not succeed or you might absolutely crush it. Thanks so much, man. Yeah, you understand like the likelihood of it actually happening, except did you get to Denali the first time you tried? No, no, we didn't. Actually, the uh, the first time we bought our climbing permits for Denali, it was back in 2013, so I would have seen you on the mountain. Okay, nice. Um, but actually, uh, Ethan and Ryan and I, the buddies that I, I went on this trip with, we went down to South America, and, and uh, we started by climbing on Concagua. Nice. And then after that, we uh, we traveled for four and a half months, went up the Pan-, Pan American Highway, and volunteered for a week in every country we passed, and went on this just, you know, big vagabond adventure and uh and documented the whole thing but we ran out of money in guatemala we never made it dude i want to interview you man what an experience that is so cool good for you thank you yeah it was a ton of fun and we (laughs) so we ended up getting to denali last summer oh man that's incredible yeah well that's awesome yeah it was it was amazing but i'm I'm certainly well versed in the the adventures not going as planned um but i hope yours do i really hope that uh that this adventure in georgia is successful for you and you hit the line you want now, anybody who wants to follow Brody on this adventure and all of his future adventures, uh, it's it's worth checking his stuff out at Brody11.com and at Brody11 across all social media. Is, is that right? That's right. Well, thanks so much for chatting with us today, Brody. It's been super inspiring hearing all of your stories. 
Yeah, thanks for the interview, Jonathan and Emily. You guys have a good one. Well, that was adventure skier and storyteller Brody Levin. Again, you can catch him across social media at Brody Levin and BrodyLevin.com. Really inspiring guy. Yeah, love that conversation. To make sure that you don't miss any interviews coming up on the Stokecast, make sure you subscribe today. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm Emily Holland. And I'm Jonathan Ronzio. We'll catch you next week with another episode of the Stokecast.